Welcome to the Impactful Leadership Show. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. John Lennon once said, a dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. Join me as we connect dreams to reality by chatting with innovators from around Washington, DC. Our show is proudly sponsored by the DC chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization. This is the Impactful Leadership Show. Well, welcome to the Impactful Leadership Show. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. I'm the CEO of Blackburn Capital Advisors and also the chapter president for the Entrepreneurs Group of Washington, DC. Today's guest is recognized as one of the top business thought leaders and leader development experts in the world. He has been named by the American Management Association of one of America's top 50 leaders to watch alongside Larry Page and Jeff, Jeff Bezos. He's been a lecturer at more than 90 colleges and universities, including MIT, Stanford, Cornell, Wharton School of Business. John has been the owner or CEO of five companies and currently serves as a board member or advisor to several organizations. As a consultant and coach to organizations worldwide from startups to Fortune 10, John is dedicated to helping people and businesses be more successful by making very complex, awesomely simple. Welcome, John. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. That's a long introduction. You could have just said, here's John, here's my friend, John. <laughs> Well, you have a, a, a longer bio on here too, so I won't get into that. No, it's, it's, I always tell people just make it up, whatever you, John is a former member of the Jamaican bobsled team. <laughs> it all works fine for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it's great to have you here. It's my pleasure. It's an honor to be here with you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to jump right into the, the uncomfortable topic of leadership. <laughs> and one of my favorite questions to ask my guests is, what are some misconceptions around leadership? Well, first one is somewhat of an opinion, uh, but I, I, you know, are leaders made or born? I believe they're made. Uh, there might be a few characteristics that help you, you know, being outgoing or whatever it might be. Although there are many, many leaders that are humble and quiet and not outgoing that are incredibly successful. But a lot of the skills uh, that are necessary to be a truly successful leader are learned skills, communication, collaboration, uh, you know, things like that, C communication skills, uh, active listening, questioning. Those are critical and they're things that can be improved. Fascinating. So I, I, I totally believe you. Um, you know, leadership isn't something you're born into, right? It is, and it's really a, a lifelong habit, right? A lifelong of learning because it, we're constantly trying to improve who we are, how we impact, how our message is perceived. Talk to me a little bit about some of the tools and tricks that you've seen around that learning journey of a, a leader or a new leader. Let's say you're coming into, you've been offered an opportunity to show your leadership skills or to organize a group. What are some of the tools or best practices you I uh, would recommend to that, to that person. I, I recently, when well, I say recently, it seems recently, it was probably a year and a half ago, uh, gave a TED talk on the future of leadership. And, you know, there's the fundamental things about leadership that will never change. Character, honesty, integrity. Uh, like I just mentioned a few, collaboration, being a great communicator, respect, things like that. But as I look forward going in the next you know, decade or beyond, there's three quotients, if you will, that I think leaders need to possess. The first one is IQ, uh, but that's not the number. That's your dedication to lifelong learning. Uh, it, as you know well from my background, I, I, I read 100 to 120 business books a year, and I have every year since 1989. If you're not constantly learning, growing, improving, there's no way you can be an effective leader. Now, I'm not, not saying you need to read 100 books. Uh, if you were, here's a quick statistic. If you were to read six business or self-improvement books per year, you'd be in the top 1%, whatever country you live in. Top 1%, you know, and not just read, it could be YouTube videos, could be podcasts like this, could be articles, you know, audio books. But if you were to spend the time with the equivalent of one book every other month, six books a year, you're in the top 1% in the country, 12 books a year, you're in the top 1% in the world. So step one is, is competence, ever-growing competence. Uh, the second quotient is EQ, your emotional quotient. Uh, and those are, those are in large part learned behaviors. Uh, 
you know, learning to have empathy. So I guess some people are born with a little bit more empathy, but someone like me who was born with zero empathy <laughs> has been able to work on skills and tools that have allowed me to, to become better at trying to understand, empathize, uh, and have compassion for other people. Uh, and the last one gets right to your question. Uh, well, hopefully both of those did, but is your AQ, which is your adaptability or agility quotient. And there's, there's several factors in that, but the two that make me the most happy, the first one is insatiable curiosity. It goes right back to AQ. Am I constantly learning, growing, stretching, getting information everywhere I can, pulling new ideas in. But right behind that, which is really cool, is your ability to unlearn things, to look at things that no longer work, to get rid of stuff that is antiquated. Uh, a great example for all of us is just two and a half years ago, um, we did not all live on Zoom. We, we compressed probably three or four years of technological advances in the way we work down to three or four months. All of us changed the way we work basically overnight. That is the ability to say stuff that worked six months ago is not going to work now and likely won't work into the future. So your IQ, EQ, and your AQ, I believe are three places that leaders need to focus. That's, that's fantastic. Um, you mentioned, John, that you, you read, you know, 120 books a year. Um, I'm not quite at that level, but maybe one day <laughs> I will be, uh, I got a couple of questions that, that come off of that. But the first one being, um, how do you, are you reading those with, you know, paper in your hands? Are they audible books? And the reason I asked that question, I'm wondering of how there's a difference between reading and understanding. And, and reading to comprehend what you're reading. Like for me, when I read a book, um, it's a slow process because I'm taking notes. I'm going on little squirrel adventures on Google and things like just trying to really comprehend. And if I multiply that by 10, it takes even longer. And so I'm curious, how do you read to comprehend versus just reading the words to read them out loud? Fantastic question. I, I actually... Learned this in my very first job. I, after I graduated from college, I went to work for one of the Rockefeller Foundations. And at the age of 26, I was named CEO. And to say that I was in over my head would be a massive <laughs> understatement. Uh, but Mr. Rockefeller assigned uh, his right-hand man, a guy named Charlie Owen, uh, to be my mentor. And this is one of the ways Charlie taught me. Every Monday, he'd put a book on my desk and he'd say, I'll see you Friday for lunch. You're going to make a book report. And I would have to be fully prepared at lunch to explain what I read and the ideas and everything else. Then here's what, where Charlie changed everything for me. He said, okay, what are the three things you're going to do differently as a result of reading that book? And I would tell him, he'd write them down and say, you'll now be held accountable in your job for doing that. That's where I made the shift between reading just for information and reading for application. Uh, so a couple other things about that. I, because I read a lot, I don't have to read the full book most of the time. Hmm. Uh, I get to a story about Steve Jobs at Apple. Like I read that 57 times. Jack Walsh at GE. I was there. <laughs> so I can skip seriously a third of a book. Um, I, I've also taken speed reading classes, so I can read very fast. And what I do is I, I skim pretty quick until I run into something that looks interesting or something I've never seen. Then I pick back up. At that point, I start underlining and I've created a whole bunch of little um, symbols that means special things to me so that I know what to read, what to reread, when there's data, when there's st statistics, when there's something I should put in a PowerPoint slide for one of my presentations. And now, Greg, if I want to go even further, after I've read the book, I will go back and reread all my highlighting and dictate it into, uh, uh, into a Word doc. And then I'll take that Word doc and boil it down a little bit more. And I can get a 250-page book down to about six pages of notes. That's fantastic. You know, it, it's, I've got a similar system that I picked up from Tim Ferriss. Oh, okay. And, Cause like years and years, I'll just, I would write in the margins and underline and then never really go back or it would take me a long time to find what I was looking for. And one of the things that he recommended was actually create your own index at the mm -hmm. front of the book. And so right on page 10, John Spence said X, Y, Z, and then on page 25. And then by the end of the book, you've got a full index. And from that, I created my own little bookmark that I then take, anyway, this is, this is not about me, but I'm interested to hear these systems. Because again, to your point, right, there's all this information 
and there's tons to read. There's podcasts to listen to, you name it. There's YouTube. Every, there's, there's a tremendous amount of content, and I always struggle with how to systematize it in a way for understanding. Uh, I use Evernote. Have you ever used that? I have used Evernote. Yeah, I use Evernote, and, and I, as I'm reading, because I, in addition to books, and so, and, and for everybody listening, uh, don't forget that's my job. <laughs> I'm a consultant, business, author, things like that. So my job is to read and keep up with things. Most people, you wouldn't have enough time. I spend, as part of my job, two hours, two and a half hours a day reading. Uh, every morning I go to breakfast for a solid hour and I do nothing but catch up on A, world events, but B, Harvard Business Review, Sloan Management Review, all that stuff every day. Uh, but I use Evernote to track stuff and, and uh, that way allows me to, to keep all that stuff done. Then I also have, luckily I have a team that if I read something important, I outline it everything and then send it to them. We also use Basecamp. So that for every one of my clients, everything I send to them, my coaching clients, everything I send to them, everything I talk to them about it is all captured so that I can go back. It's indexed like that. I can go back and hit a keyword and find base, literally something I talked to them about 15 years ago. Interesting. Yeah, so I'm afraid that's through, the way it goes. <laughs> you know, there's somebody in our audience starting their leadership journey. They're, they have this in, this need and this desire to learn and read and consume more information. And it sounds like, John, you've got a really succinct system of capturing that. But if you were just starting out and you wanted to double how much content you're consuming in a year, what are some, you, you mentioned Evernote, are there certain sort of baby steps that you would recommend someone take to, to start that? Yeah, there, there's, and it's a little counterintuitive but it's what's worked for me because it, it matches with the way I learn is my recommendation is pick one topic that you really want to go deep on and, and read a whole bunch of books on that topic. You know, let's just say leadership. People ask me all the time, John, you know, how many leadership books have you read? Probably well over 200. Uh, they go, doesn't that get redundant? I go, yeah, which is great because I've discovered the pattern. And that's also how I read them so fast because I look and I go, okay, I know this idea, I know this idea. And then what I do is I look across the six or eight or 10 or 20 books I've read and go, all right, what's the pattern of the main ideas? Once I've got that pattern, it's really easy to read another leadership book because I can recognize the pattern quickly. But again, when I, when I work with people, I say, all right, let's pick a topic, strategic planning. We're going to do nothing but read about strategic planning for the next six months. Mm -hmm. We're going to watch videos, listen to audiobooks, read articles, read books, everything. And what's going to happen at the end of six months, you're going to get bored because everything is saying the same five, six, seven things. Congratulations. You now have the general theme of strategic plan. It doesn't make you an expert, but now you've got sort of a framework that you built for yourself that you can use on that particular topic. And then you so, pick another one. And I don't, you know, it might be six months, eight months, a year to, to get through one. But at the end of the year, you're, you, you would be considered, truthfully, among the most well-read and well-informed people on that topic in the world. What is, what are, are I'm sorry, I mean, ask the question a little bit differently. Um, in the topic of leadership, have yeah. you come across any new concepts or different approaches over the last two, three, four years? Or is it seriously a repetition of that pattern? Granted, there's obviously some variance yeah. across the, that pattern, but any, any new concepts have just sort of blown your mind? That's a fantastic question. The answer is yes. Um, when I started in business in 1989, when I graduated from college, it was all command and control. When your boss said jump, it was how high and how many times, sir. And it was all white males. Then when I got to the middle part of my career, it all turned into leadership slash management by numbers, by spreadsheet. No emotion, no nothing. We need to, we need to reduce headcount because we need to make our numbers. Let go out and fire a thousand people. Now I see it sort of swing back to something that was in vogue in the 70s a little bit called servant leadership, where we kind of put it on its head. Instead of the leader being at the top of the pyramid, telling everyone what to do, they're literally at the bottom of the period saying, what can I do to help you? How can I serve you? So the thing I've seen, I think it's part of the generation that's just come in the last eight or 10 years into the workforce is uh, servant leadership, 
stewardship, and a big focus on purpose. Um, the folks in the workplace now, the younger, I'm 58, the folks quite a bit younger than me, position, title, paycheck are important, but they're the, not, not the most important. The most important is, am I doing something meaningful? Am I helping people? Uh, as they say at Apple, am I making a dent in the universe? That's been the big change. And I see a lot of organizations now trying to focus on how can I connect what our company does to something truly meaningful to our employees where they're intrinsically motivated every day to come and do the best work they can. Interesting. And so taking that a little bit further, right? You, you just talked about these waves within leadership. What do you see going forward? I mean, how do you see us at the beginning of this current wave in the middle, near the end? What would you envision 15, 20 years from now as sort of the, the concept or the approach to uh, around leadership? I think, uh, the, the work from home or flexible work will never go away. We've crossed that threshold and we're not going back over it. So understanding the ideas of boundaries, uh, and I won't call it work-life balance, work-life integration, uh, you're going to have to be more flexible with your best, with all your employees, but especially with your best employees, you can command, you know, a good, and again, well, I'll, I'll give you an idea quickly. And I think this is going to go forward. I did a bunch of research on this several years ago, looking at more than 10,000 high potential employees at top companies around the world. Whether it was a small company or a Fortune 10, I looked at what are the best employees? Why do they work in those companies? And here's what they told me, six things. Number one was fair pay, not just 10% above or below what I'd make to do the same job anyplace else. As long as we get parity on pay, we're cool. Next one was meaningful work. Next one was cool colleagues. Next one was a great culture. Next one was personal and professional development. Am I learning constantly? Is my company investing in me? And can I see myself here in five or six years? And then the last one, which was actually by far the most important, was I work for a leader I trust, respect, and admire. Mm -hmm. I think you look at those things and you add it together with highly flexible hybrid work, uh, that those are the things that are going to keep people around. As a caveat to that, businesses are starting to understand, I don't have to hire from my town. Uh, I've got some friends that run banks and credit unions that are, uh, you know, if I wanted someone to do mortgages, I wanted to come in and sit in the office. Now they say, I can get someone in a completely different part of the country to do mortgages because I can do it over Zoom or we can handle it. We do that all um, at a distance. I can hire the best mortgage broker in the country who lives on the other side of the country and you know, maybe they live in a small town where the salary I would normally pay in New York or Miami or LA uh, is going to be unbelievable for them. And I get all that talent. So now we used to say, it, A, it's a war for talent, which it still is uh, with a great resignation by far. But the world is your talent pool now. Uh, I, I, one of the folks that works for me lives in Madrid, one just headed to Cuba and the other one's moving to, to uh, California. I will have no one that works for me in the town I live in. Wow. Wow. You know, one of the, one of the items on your list around culture really jumped off the page for me as it pertains to working from home. I would love to hear some insights or your thoughts around how to maintain a good corporate culture, a strong corporate culture through an online Zoom virtual work environment. Hey, listen, my time for this podcast has just run out. I'm going to have to leave. Um, that's the, I won't say the 60, but that's the $684 billion question in, in the way, the thing I phrased that is culture at a distance, create culture at a distance. And here's what it comes down to. We've lost, one of my clients calls it is uh, micro relationships or micro uh, seeing each other quickly and talking. This sounds, again, counterintuitive. You have to literally sit down and plan for what you want to seem like chance meetings and chance things to talk about people. So you actually have to create a way to connect on a personal level, not just a Zoom meeting, uh, which means calling people just talk about their family. Uh, I just talked to one of the directors at Amazon last night. She's a friend. She said what she does is send somebody a Grubhub thing and says, buy lunch and let's sit down for an hour over lunch, over Zoom and just chat. I don't talk about business. I don't talk, I want to talk about your hobbies and your family or where you tend to plan to take your vacation. But business is off the table. 
It's just you and I sitting having lunch together talking. That seems fake kind of, <laughs> but that's the way we work now. So if I'm not going to see, I just saw uh, one of my good friends who I've been mentoring for 10 years. The first time we've seen each other in two and a half years was this morning for breakfast. Wow. We've been talking every, every three or four weeks, but I had not actually been able to give him a hug for two and a half years. So we're going to have to learn how to adjust to that. It's that's really right. hard, Greg, really hard. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that because you said it so well. Um, so it's shifting gears a little bit, John, what's got your attention now? Like what, and it doesn't have to be around leadership. It could be anything, but what's, what's getting you excited about life at the moment? Well, there's two things. Uh, one thing that's on my radar and then one thing that's getting me really excited. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that excites me. The one thing on my radar, which is, I think is something I worked with your EO chapter on, is the future of business. How technology is going to dramatically change the way we do business. Uh, computer speed is unfathomable. The fastest computers right now in the world, if you were to take the amount of calculations they could do per second and actually do one calculation per second, it can do 34 billion years worth of computation a second. And that's only gonna get faster and faster and faster. So I look at autonomous cars, um, robotics is off the chain, incredibly interesting. Um, using artificial intelligence, using massive computers for medical. Uh, I mean, things that, that we could never imagine doing are within our grasp now. And in, and in our lifetime, uh, you know, there's gonna be tremendous things. If you have kids right now, I, I was talking to a friend the other day who has a four-year-old uh, daughter and I said, she will likely never drive a car. By the time she grows up and gets her driver's license, you know, we'll probably be close to autonomous. And if they have kids, they'll probably be in, in flying cars because they're already doing that stuff in Abu Dhabi and other places where they have um, giant electric helicopters that are cabs. You can hire it, it lands on the building or out in a, a pad, you get in it, and it autonomously flies you to another building and leaves you there. That, that's wow. happening today. Um, so I, I teach a class on this. I, I mentioned when, before we started the podcast, I'll be in my 22nd year as a guest lecturer at Wharton. And I teach a class on the future of business and it is the most mind numbing, head spinning class that anybody goes through while they're there. And they typically go directly from my class to the bar, uh, even if it's to nine in the morning. <laughs> the other one that's really interesting to me is, is, is self-development. I'm not a, you know, self-help guru or anything, but to give you an idea, I, I'm a real, I've, I've been teaching a class called strategies for success for many, many years. It goes back to the fact that I, I failed out of college on the first try and graduated number three in the United States on the second try and became CEO of the Rockefeller Foundation in 26. That path of failure to get there, I recorded all of that when I was going through it. And one of the, to give you a quick example, one of the first exercises I do in that program is asking people to write down their personal core values. And out of 100 people that come to my class, 99 have never done that. They've never sat down and thought it through. And I, again, I was teaching a class the other day in Zoom and, one, and I asked that question. And one of the senior executives in a company said, I can tell you the organization's values right now. I have no idea what mine are. I am excited about trying to help people think through that. Again, I don't wanna be a self-help guru. I just wanna help people look at some deep questions and answer them for themselves. So John, for, for the audience who's listening, tell us why that's important. Why is it important to have personal core values? I, I have a great quote from Walt Disney. When values are clear, decisions are easy. When you understand your core values, you can make even the most challenging decisions in your life in, in a short span of time. Just compare them. The other side of that, is when you haven't really thought about it, but you have stress and anxiety in your life, oftentimes it's because you're violating a value that you hadn't thought about. A, a quick example, again, I was teaching this years ago and I got to this and I had a woman in my class start crying. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking, it, probably in her fifties, just tears running down her face. I said, what's wrong? She said, I just wrote down that my top two values are God and family. I haven't been to church in three years and I only see my kids about 15 minutes a night. Now I know why I'm so sad. 
Uh, luckily, she called me back about six months and said, I've completely flipped that around. And now I realize how happy I could be if I just followed those values, which I did not know before I got in your class. Some of the other things we do is we talk about what is your personal definition of success? You know, most people will say that success is money, fame, and power. All those things are nice, but I've worked for several billionaires, and I will tell you right now, money, fame, and power does not make you happy or successful. Uh, so that, that's another challenge. When people write it down, they realize this isn't what society told me. I mean, some want to be rich, famous, and powerful. Great. Got a private island on the Bahamas with helicopters. I'm to totally cool with that. But most people realize, no, it's about family, friends, service, things like that, giving back to their community. And that changes it to, I don't have to make a gazillion dollars. I just need to be a good person and take care of other people. Certainly. <clears throat> you know, when I was confronted with those questions, the personal core value and your, you know, what your purpose in life, you know, years ago, um, my biggest struggle was I'm sitting down and there's a blank piece of paper and I got a pen in my hand. How do I get started? Right. It's, it's difficult just to hear a facilitator say, okay, write down your core values. Do you have a, a quick and dirty, and that's not the right words, but do you have a process, another process to, as somebody is sitting here listening to our podcast and they're wondering how to take that first step into discovering their core value or core values, um, what would you recommend their first step be? Well, the, the first step is just to think of, look at values that other people have. And, you know, and start listing them out. Even ones that you not have, creativity, innovation, family, faith, uh, contribution, uh, adventure, uh, safety, you know, and then just blot them down or whatever, and then look and see which ones uh, jump out at you. Uh, it's, it's a hard process. When I assign this in a, in a class, I give people 20 minutes just to start to jot stuff down. Most people are still looking at the paper. So I'm going to, as a, I'm going to make an offer yeah, totally for free, totally free, 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 free. I wrote a handbook on this uh, called Strategies for Success. It's about a 28 page workshop of all the things we're talking about with explanations and everything. So if anybody wants a copy of that for free, 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 I never <laughs> I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to sell anything. Just send me an email. My email is john at johnspence.com. Uh, and Greg, if you, I don't know if you're going to do show notes on this or whatever, but I can send you a, a, a PDF that people can download. But if you want a copy, just send me an email at john at johnspence.com and say you want the strategies for life success or strategy book or whatever. And I'll just send you the PDF and give it to anybody. I mean, I wrote this thing so people could sit down and think some of these things through and potentially change their life. And an important point there, I am not changing their life. <laughs> they are asking themselves important questions and changing their own lives. That's awesome. <clears throat> awesome, John. It's very generous. Um, we will certainly add that into the show notes. And you, you led into my next question of um, how, do, how, do our, how does our audience find you? Are you LinkedIn, johnspence.com? What's your favorite? Uh, favorite uh, definitely favorite LinkedIn. Medium? Yeah, LinkedIn, please connect with me. I'd love that. Uh, also, I, I write a my blog just got named one of the top 100 uh, leadership and business blogs in the world. So it, it should be okay. Uh, I'd say sign up for my blog. And, and also when you sign up for the blog, I have this really cool uh, newsletter. Uh, when I find an article I really like somewhere, I send it to this thing and it has AI. And what it does is it sees, Greg, you know, the first couple of times it's sort of general and it sees which articles you open up and how long you read them and all that stuff. Then it starts to customize the newsletter to your particular likes. And after a couple of months out of the hundred articles I send to it that I've read and like a month, it picks the top 12 or 15 just for you. So really, really cool thing. So when you sign up for the blog, you get that it comes out every two weeks and it's just links to awesome articles and, and other people's blogs around the world. Yeah, it's one of those newsletters that I look forward to every other week. But I am curious why mine's always blank. <laughs> <laughs> well played, amigo. Well played. <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> well, John, it's been great having you on the show. Um, again, all your contact information and things will be in our show notes. Uh, we've we touched on very highly uh, some very deep topics. And so I, I hope this sparks some interest with our audience around leadership. 
Um, again, it's great to see you and I, I appreciate your time. Of course, it's great to see you. It's my pleasure. We're both here to help people. So everything works out pretty good in the end. Absolutely. And that's a wrap, my friends. Thank you for spending your time with me. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at impactfulleadershipshow.com. One last food for thought, walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone.